we're going to get started. Um, there'll be some time for people to, to keep popping in. Welcome. My name is Jesse Bernstein. I am a writer, director, and performer in Philadelphia. I've been working with Theodore Ariel for a while now. Uh, my last two solo pieces were produced by Theodore Ariel. They were Ethics of the Fathers and also most recently The Scribe. So welcome to everybody. We have a small mighty group here, which is great actually, because that means um, if people have questions, I can probably unmute you and let you ask live. Uh, we are in webinar Zoom format. So that means it's okay that you can't see or hear yourselves, um, but feel free to type things into the chat. There's also a Q&A function if you locate that that I'll be checking out as we go. But hopefully uh, I've got some questions planned. We'll answer all of your questions as we go. This of course is Theodore Ariel's How Does an Artistic Director Plan a Season Seminar? And we have two lovely people who I'm going to introduce to you now. And let's bring them on. We have Deborah Bear Moses, who most of you probably know, who is the founding artistic director of Theater Ariel. And then also Damon Benetti, <clears throat> who is the co-founding artistic director of Philadelphia Artists Collective, also known as PAC. And I'm going to let them do, welcome, welcome. I'm gonna let them do the uh, Hillel standing on one foot, give you everything you need to know version of their bios and also of their a little introduction to their company. So Deborah, I'll start with you. Okay, so uh, this is actually Theodore Ariel's 30th anniversary season. Uh, and uh, I wasn't expecting that it would all be on Zoom. <laughs> Uh, our mission is to do work, uh, new and established work, that illuminates the social, cultural, and spiritual heritage of the Jewish people. Uh, we present plays that are Jewish stories, but always with the goal that they will um, enlighten us on universal themes, and especially the shared human values that we have. And. Uh, I think that our form, our performance form, has changed a lot over the years. For a while, we were doing um, performances uh, in the Walnut Street studio and bringing audiences to us, but we kept being asked by people to bring our shows to them. So we switched to a touring company and we tour toured extensively between Boston and, and DC and out as far as um, uh, Pittsburgh. And we did that. And then in 2010, we, after schlepping and being a wandering Jew for all those years, we decided it was time to be home-based and we switched to salon theater. And for those of you who are new to Theater Ariel, you'll get, that's the form that you will be seeing a lot of our work this year. So that's standing on one foot, Theater Ariel. Terrific, thank you. And Damon, can you tell, and Theodore Ariel's website is there in the chat for anyone who wants to check it out now or later. Um, Damon, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about PAC, please? Sure, I won't be standing on one foot, but sitting on both cheeks. <laughs> but uh, hey everybody, uh, my name is Damon Benetti. I'm the co-founding artistic director of the Philadelphia Artist Collective. Like Theodore Ariel, we're, we're celebrating a milestone this year as well because this is our 10th anniversary season. Um, PAC is a site-specific rare theater company. Uh, we do rare classics and we do them in site-specific locations. Uh, we usually do two shows a year and we've done shows in museums, in historic homes, on ships. Uh, in our 10 year history, we've only done two shows in an actual theater. <laughs> uh, so that was site-specific for us. Um, we're a company that really believes in, in the intimate experience of being close to the artist. Uh, we're artist forward. Um, most of our budget all goes to actors and artists. We have artists in residences that create artwork that's inspired by the shows that we're doing, whether it's visual art in terms of painting or photography or sculpture uh, or music. Uh, and we, yeah, we do two shows a year. We have a reading series. 
Uh, we are now partnering with other theater companies like Theater Ariel this coming, uh, this coming spring, winter. Uh, this, current, this year, we're, uh, we are partnering with Philadelphia Asian Performing Artists in November to do the recognition of Shakuntala. And we've partnered in the past with Theater, uh, theater in the X and with um, Teatro del Sol. Theater in the X is a black theater company here in Philly. And Teatro del Sol is the only bilingual theater company here in Philly. Um, but the mission is to really put the plays forward and put the classics forward and, and really kind of expanding like what the classics are in terms of what we think of as classics, that's just Shakespeare, but they come from all over. Uh, and in terms of like my personal history, the only two credits that are important is that I was once directed by Roberta Sloan in Visiting <laughs> Mr. Green at Hedgerow Theater. And I was once directed by Jesse Bernstein in that Jewish classic, It's a Wonderful Life at uh, the Water Street Theater. You know, I pitched myself as the director for that because Jews have a long history of writing and producing Christmas carols and other <laughs> of course. pieces. That was part of how I... Um, <laughs> and one thing I think that's cool actually about your two organizations, if I may, is that um, Damon, as, as you alluded to, the PAC, what I've always appreciated is that it is so beyond Shakespeare, that it is delving into parts of the classics that people are not familiar with. And I think Deborah Theodore Ariel has also likewise tried to hew away from standard, typical regional theater Jewish plays. Uh, and so this is a great example of people with difficult missions, actually. So it's a great, two great companies to, to explore how you pick pieces. Um, Real quick, Damon, I'll start with you this time. Can you just give us a brief overview of, of what your season looks like this year? And yeah. obviously for both of you, this is an odd season because of uh, there's something going on that's yeah. making gathering difficult. Yeah. So like pretty much every theater company, especially in this area, we are, everything we're doing is on Zoom or online. Um, we try to do like one thing a, a month so even if it's something that's personal, we have a thing called a pack pass, which is like a membership. And so we do special like pack pass only events for people. So for example, in September, we had a, a pack pass tea. So it was tea and uh, with me and my co-founder, Dan Hodge. Uh, Dan, if, you, if, you, if you're a Philly theater goer, you know Dan, because you've seen him at the Walnut, you've seen him at the Arden, at the Lantern. Uh, so he's my buddy and he and I co-founded the theater company. So uh, in October, we are doing Trouble in Mind by Alice Childress. Uh, this is directed by Amina Robinson. And what we're doing with this is that it's a free reading, but all donations are going to Black Lives Matter Philly. It's gonna be not just a reading, but it's a bit more cinematic in terms of we're recording it. We have a videographer attached to it that's gonna be doing some special things with it. Uh, and we've also had designers with it. So people will be in period clothes, there'll be music. We've had a production designer do some set work like Zoom work, so like box work to create like different environments. Uh, that's in October. November is uh, the partnership with Philadelphia Asian Performing Artists. That's the recognition of Shakuntala. In December, we might actually do an in-person thing. And that's the crazy thing because um, we have a relationship with this vineyard down in uh, Piles Grove, New Jersey called Auburn Road Vineyard. And for 10 years, getting back to that whole Christmas theme, uh, we've been doing a Christmas carol, like a, two, a two person adaptation that I adapted for uh, an actor and a musician who also does all the Foley. So we've always done it in person. So they've established like a whole outdoor stage and with heaters and like fire pits and stuff like that. And it's like a, and it's like, it got a PA system and everything. So depending on the weather, we might actually do that live for people and then live stream it as well. So that's December, January is another T. February, we have a new play series where we're, we're doing um, six 10 minute plays inspired by the classics or that refute the classics, all based around a theme of transformation. Uh, in March, we partner with Theater Ariel. And then in April, May, we are the, the Mandel Professional in Residence Project at Drexel University. And what that is, is that the Drexel every year has a company come in, uses their big stage, and it's a co-production for a show that normally we wouldn't be able to do on our own because it's bigger than what we normally do. So we have a brand new adaptation that, that we're writing of Jane Eyre. And that's gonna be the, like a few month process in the spring. 
What's probably going to happen is that it's going to be moved to the fall because of COVID and the ability to, to meet. So what we'll end up doing is we'll do a reading. We'll do a, a reading of this new version of Jane Eyre in the spring. And then we end with a party, which will be online probably, as opposed to in person, which is a season announcement party. So in a large nutshell, Jesse. <laughs> Great. You guys are action packed. I love it. One thing a month. One thing a month. That's, that's impressive. Sure. Especially for an organization that has like half a person running it. Like <laughs> you guys have a small staff. Small staff. A mighty yeah. staff of five. There you go. Uh, Deborah, can you tell us about Theater Ariel's season? Yes, um, and as uh, Damon said, I, like all the theaters that we know, it's going to be a virtual season. And we're also doing something almost every single month. We're starting next Thursday. We're opening with a beautiful play called Secret Things by Elaine Romaro. And it is a play about uh, the a Converso family, a family that discovers their roots in um, the Spanish Jewish world. And uh, it's, um, there are lots of people in uh, New Mexico and, out, and uh, Arizona now in the Latinx community that are actually discovering that they have um, Jewish roots and history. And um, one of the things I'm excited about is I'm working with um, two of the founders of Teatro del Sol, which Damon mentioned. Um, and, uh, and it's a beautiful, beautiful play. Then we are bringing live from Israel a one-person show, and it will be live from Israel, uh, written and performed by a dear friend of mine, Robbie Gringross, who, is, who made Aliyah to Israel, I think, 25 or 30 years ago, and, and the play is called Why I'm Still Here, and uh, it will be live from Herzliya. And then in December, we're doing a piece that uh, is a very moving and powerful piece of 12 very short monologues written by Jews of color. So black, uh, African American Jews, Asian Jews, uh, Latino Jews, um, the pieces are really moving and very powerful. And uh, the piece was originally created by the Jewish Women's Theater of LA, which was the theater that actually inspired me to start doing salon theater because that's what they that's been their mission from day one and then in january we're going to have some classes and workshops um one that jesse bernstein will be doing um and then in um february we're going to bring another piece from israel uh, another live from israel piece this time it'll be from uh, tel aviv and it is a one woman show called passion killers and it's by written and performed by hadar galron who is a leading light in um, israeli theater now and it's a stand-up comedy biblical midrash uh, a very irreverent um, look at uh, several women from the Bible and also Esther and we're doing it a few days before Purim. And then uh, we move into um, March and in March we are collaborating with PAC. And uh, we're going to be doing a reading of an, uh, one of my absolute favorite American Jewish theater classics. It's called Morning Star, and it's by Sylvia Reagan, who most people have never heard of, um, and was an important Jewish uh, and an American theater playwright. And it's a wonderful piece that looks at a family over several generations. And one of the things that for me is really powerful about the piece is um, it de delves into, in part, the Triangle Fire, which um, killed almost all of the immigrant women who were seamstresses in this um, um, factory. And that, that the death of those women really had a major impact on, the, um, on unions and the development of unions in this country. And March is actually um, when the fire happened so we're doing it in honor of that 
And then in April, we're going to close our season with um, an adaptation of um, stories collected by Howard Schwartz, who's one of the leading um, anthologists and folklorist who's been collecting Jewish folk tales for years and has published 11 books and is you know, worldwide respected as an important uh, story collector. And so we're gonna end our 30th season with a, with a look back at the beginnings of Jewish storytelling. So that's our season. So, and put together by a company with I think only two real employees. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm exhausted hearing how much you guys are doing. It's incredible. Um, and I mean that in the best way. Like, so my, my first question as we delve into this, because I think it can be surprising just how much a theater company does, not just in terms of the plays that we see, but like the classes and the, the things that are happening here and the collaborations. So a theater season, uh, a lot of people are probably aware. I would say generally a, a nonprofit regional theater season is considered to go from around late August, early September into June, maybe as late as July. That's at least in Philadelphia, that tends to be kind of what we, we see from a lot of companies. So my question for that is when does the planning start? So we're looking at the 2021 20, 2020 to 2021 season. Um, Deborah, when did the planning for this season start, would you say? So I would say the planning is ongoing. I'm always getting scripts. Year round, I'm getting scripts. So for instance, the play Secret Things that we're opening, that play has been on my desk for three years and I've been waiting for the right moment to, to do that work. So part, part of the planning process is that I'm always reading scripts, I'm always getting scripts. Uh, and so I would say that it happens all year round and then, and then gets very aggressive and, and, and point specific starting usually around March. Um, but I often will have a play or two, like I'll have a short list of plays that I've been considering um, and then, you know, add to that as I read. Also, uh, very much this year, but it, it, it's happened at other years. This year I had a, a number of plays on my list, but I didn't feel that they would work well on Zoom uh, for various reasons. And also to be honest, I really, um, it really was influenced by all that, the energy um, that's in our, in our country right now. Um, and so I had a play on my shortlist that I really love, but I felt it was just too dark, just too dark. And I just felt that I don't, I don't want to go there because there's enough in the universe that is, 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 uh, dark. And so I, I decided it, even though it's fabulous play and fascinating not to do that. I, I wanted to go with pieces that are life affirming at a time when we're all in isolation and, and separated from each other. At the same time, um, this is a time when theaters and when the nation is being challenged about what stories are being told and what stories are not being told. And as I said, Secret Things has been on my list for a while. Um, and it deals with um, the Sephardic culture, the Latinx um, stories in, within Judaism. But I also really wanted to look at what other stories are we not telling? Because most Jewish theater is very Ashkenazi centric, very Eastern Western European centric. And I feel that I really, I take ownership. I have not done enough to search beyond that myself. And so I felt really challenged um, this season to, to you know, stretch um, our audience um, and go to, the, you know, to Jewish stories that need to be told and haven't been told. So I think it's a combination of what lands on my plate and also what I go looking for and the go looking for can be, you know, inspired by a variety of things. 
Damon, I'll take the same. How, how when do you start planning and and like Deborah did, maybe start talking about like what are some of the factors that make something a yay or nay for you guys? Sure. I mean, this year, uh, even before everything hit, was a unique year for us because uh, it was our tenth anniversary season. So we <laughs> normally it gets to be about April, and Dan and myself and and Charlotte Northeast, uh, who's another actor director in town. Uh, who are the who are the main um, uh, artistic people? And now we have Natasha Sconiers. Uh, we usually around April. It's like we we got to find a season. We got to pick some plays. <laughs> and it's like, what do you like? What do you like? What do you want to do? What jazz is you right now? Um, and usually it becomes like passion projects. It's usually stuff that's like, I really want to do this. I really want to do this. So this being our tenth anniversary season, we were planning for this season this time last year and trying to figure out, okay, what's going to work. And also we wanted to feature, feature us a little bit again. We wanted to make sure that we had partnerships. So we had reached out to, to Papa, Philadelphia Asian Performing Artists, uh, because we wanted to do um, uh, an Asian classic or an Indian classic, um, which is what Shakuntala is. It's, a, it's an Indian classic. It's a fourth century Indian play. Uh, and and I've, I've known Deborah for, for years. Um, I forgot one of my other, the only other acting credit that's important that I've done is uh, the Man in the Sukkah last year with Theodore Ariel. This is the only three credits that are important. <laughs> um, but, uh, but like Deborah and I have been talking for years and we talked for years about Morningstar and how much we love the play. And, and I got to, when I was a, a first year in grad school, I got to understudy it and I uh, just loved it. And so she knew it. And so it just like, just finding the time to do that. So this seemed right, those partnerships. And then we had the plays and we were gonna do the new play festival. And so that was gonna be the season. So Dan and Tay were going to be in the fall show. I was going to direct it. Charlotte is Jane Eyre. So she's going to be in that. And Casey McMillan is directing that. And so like that was going to be the season. And then we're going to have these new plays that we're going to do. And then, and then everything happened. Um, and so we, and then, you know, it was the benchmarks. So all of a sudden you realize, oh, okay, well, nothing can happen in the summertime. Oh, no, okay, nothing's going to happen in the fall. So like all of our programming, of course, you know, became something else. So over the summertime, what we did to keep ourselves active, we did two things. We did something called the Pactrospective, which was we decided we were going to do a retrospective anyway for the 10 years. So I started doing interviews with designers, actors, artists, and residences of our shows, starting with our last one and moving backwards. <clears throat> and then doing those as like little like things we put on YouTube or, or on Facebook Live. And then we started doing something called the Pactdemic. I, it's too much. Pactrospective. I know. <laughs> um, so the pandemic was a reading club. So as opposed to like going to see a reading, what it would be is that we took suggestions from like our pack pass people, from uh, people that, that, that support the company, uh, anybody who went on our Facebook page and suggested plays. So the first play we did was the God, <clears throat> the gods are, the gods are not to blame, which is a, a Nigerian take on, on Oedipus. And so, so that was the first one we did. So people who registered for it got sent a copy of the script. So they got the script, so the people read it and then came into a Zoom session like this, but we could see each other and we would talk about the play. So we did that. And then the next one we did was Trouble in Mind by Alice Childress. And I'd never read this play before. It was written in 1955. And it's about, it's a play within a play. It's a, a mixed cast of black and white actors coming to the first rehearsal of a Broadway play of an anti-lynching play written by a white playwright directed by a white director. And written in 55, I was just blown away by how amazing this play is and how current it is, but also how modern it feels in terms of its language as well. So when we're talking about scrapping the fall show and trying to put like, what are we gonna do in, in the fall now? Uh, it's like, we should do this. Um, we should do this. And so we found a director, uh, the, our, 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 we reached out to Amina Robinson, who's a wonderful director, who just won the Barrymore last year. She's the, the first black female director to win a Barrymore in Philadelphia for her production of The Color Purple at Theater Horizon last year. And, and she's amazing. And, and we got a great cast together. And <clears throat> so that's, that's kind of where that came from, um, the trouble of mind. And then the partnerships, we, we kind of let the partners pick the plays. So Papa picked Shakuntala. Deborah and I had talked about, and we had a meeting at that uh, corner bakery 
and uh, and you were like, I want to do Morning Star. And secretly, I was hoping that she was going to pick Morning Star. <laughs> I was just hoping that that's what was going to happen, and then it happened. Um, yeah, and then Jane Eyre <clears throat> was a. We wanted to do Jane Eyre, and we were looking for adaptations of it, and 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 translate not translations, but adaptations of it. And the one we wanted, we couldn't get because we couldn't get the rights to it. So um, if you know uh, Tiny Dynamite, they're another small theater company in town run by Casey McMillan. But Casey, Jessica Bedford, Megan Winch, and Charlotte Northeast, they wrote this thing that, that was really popular the last year or two called The Complete Works of Jane Austen Abridged. And they did it it's at the- It's quite physical. good. It's really good. And the four of them are very, very talented. And they adapted all of Jane Austen's novels into this wonderful, like little, like complete works of Shakespeare kind of thing. So when we realized we weren't gonna get the rights to Jane Eyre, the one we wanted, I think it was Dan. Dan said, well, why don't we write it? And so it was like, well, we know the people that can do it. And so we just got uh, the first cut of it and it's really good. Uh, we're doing a workshop of it at DeSales University. And then we'll have a couple of in-house readings and then we'll see what happens in the spring in terms of like, you know, we're probably not gonna be able, it'll probably be another reading. And then we do the show in the fall, hopefully, or in the spring, depending on when, when the world comes back to people going to, to theaters again. Awesome. So, uh, Deborah, let me ask you this. In your mind, um, obviously we don't want a season that, like you said, right? Sometimes it's, it's what's happening in the world, right? Determines things. Um, we obviously don't want to do a season that's going to be the same kind of show over and over and over again. So in your mind, like what makes an ideal season? Like how, what do you picture? I know there are some companies that have a formula, right? There are some companies that are like, fall's our comedy, winter's our musical. Um, sorry to anyone who hears my cat having a hairball in the background. Uh, you know, then we do our drama right after the holiday, right? Whatever it is. So I know Theater Ariel doesn't really have that kind of formula. So, so do you think at all about like, by the end of this season, here's what my audience has journeyed through at all? Yes and no. <laughs> so yeah, some, there have been a couple of times when I've actually set out um, with a theme in mind. Um, and, and, <laughs> one of them was inspired by a Jewish joke <laughs> that I've always liked. And I got two plays on my desk that, that kind of reminded me of that joke. Um, and so I ended up doing a season. Um, and so then I ended up looking for other plays and the season was food, family, and philosophy. And so occasionally that I've, I've had a, a vision for a theme and then shape the plays in that way. Um, I also, I like a season to have an emotional arc so that people ha go through different um, emotional experiences with the plays. So uh, I, when I'm picking plays, I'll have a short list and then I'll look at the plays and you know look at what is the emotional arc. Um, that my my audience will experience, and also um, to be honest, a lot I can't always do. I I have to balance how many actors are are going to be over the course of a season, so that will have sometimes have an impact. Where you know I'll go, oh, looks like all of the plays I have right now have five actors. That may not be as cost effective as I want, so that sometimes. So sometimes a play I'll like, I'll go, okay, I'll do that one next year. Um, I think the emotional arc is a really big one for me. That I want plays, I want my audience, I want myself to go on a journey um, emotionally. Also, I try to find plays that um, go, to, are, are in different times and in different locations. So like one of the seasons that I, particularly liked, uh, I really was proud of. We started the season in Israel. Then we went to the Lower East Side. Then we went to um, 
uh, a contemporary family in New York City. So it was a different tone than the Lower East Side. And then we ended the season um, in Germany um, and Philadelphia and Germany, actually. And so I, 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 I just really liked the fact that in that season, we went to different places and different time periods. Um, so that's also what I will look at at times. You mentioned the, um, the actors issue, and I think this is maybe something that a lot of audiences we don't think about as we're sitting in the theater, but nonprofit theater companies, any business, right, operates inside of a budget. And both, you know, your professional theater companies, you pay your actors. Uh, I know PAC has some equity contracts that they have to, to figure out, right, which comes with its own administrative and economic um, requirements. And so without getting into nitty gritty, obviously, of, of the, the finances, but Let's talk a little bit, Deborah, if you could start. The, how does the realities, right, of uh, come into play and, and how much do you have to consider that and, and what sort of, you know, real world concerns also go into the artistic endeavor of a season? Um. It, 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 it is a, uh, just play an important role. I mean, for instance, we, we do salon theater. So we're in people's homes. And so there already is a restriction because um, we did a play that I loved with um, eight characters and we couldn't even fit them in the living room. <laughs> so like some of the actors were sat in the audience, some had to be out in the lobby. Um, so I realized that that as much as I like that play, and that was one of our early salon seasons, I realized that's not practical, either financially or in terms of, you know, where we're setting our place. Uh, so I, I, that's, I discovered that really the max I can fit into a living room is five. And so that, that already, you know, I get, sometimes I get these fabulous scripts and they have eight actors, um, but I know I can't do that again because, you know, so that, that's one of the ask, that's one of the things that determines it. But also I can't, I, I have to be conscious over the course of the season, you know, what my budget is. And so um, it helps um, to be able to have, you know, some plays that are, have five actors and, and, you know, last year and the year before we had your two wonderful one person shows. Uh, so it is, it is, I, I can't imagine. I charged that a fortune from you. No. <laughs> <laughs> I know we went bankrupt. <laughs> um, so that is a factor that I, I do have to consider, you know, over the, you know, what, what the shape is over the course of the season. Um, just because, you know, we are a nonprofit theater, we are reliant on our donors and our, on our box office to make sure at the end of the year, I can go to my board and say, we broke even, or we made, we made a few shekels this year. And Damon, to you, uh, and maybe you can talk a little bit about being site specific as well. And how does that, you know, do, are there venues that you know are available or that become unavailable? You talked a little bit about that with going online. Um, what are some of the sort of nitty gritty reality parts of picking a season that, that maybe we don't consider? Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, being site specific, you know, it has its other kind of, has its own limitations and um, what's the opposite of limitations? Opportunities. Opportunities, it's great. <laughs> so, I'm for example, I think of that. that's good. You know, you're sharp. <laughs> you right place. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, so, like, I'm going to give an example that's kind of like economics and also artistic at the same time. So, we did a play called Mary Rose by, by J. M. Barry, that is um, that, who wrote Peter Pan, and uh, Claire Moyer, who's the artistic associate at Inish Newman Theater Company. Uh, she brought the play to me, and she wanted to do it as a reading. And I was like, great, uh, let, me, let me read it. And I, I thought it was beautiful. And so we did it as a reading and I just thought it was gorgeous and heartbreaking and funny. And I, I said, we should do this. And I know where to do it uh, because it was my turn to direct the next year. And so I wanted to do something at the Woodlands Mansion and Cemetery, which is out in West Philly, like on 40th and Woodland. 
And so I knew that's where I wanted to do something and we'd been talking to them, but I didn't know what the piece was. And Mary Rose was perfect. It's a three act play. It takes place at a man in a mansion house. And then the second act is on an island. And then the third act is back at the mansion house. And it's a mansion in a cemetery. So the cemetery became the island. So I talked to, I talked to Claire about this and I said, I want you to do this, but you have to do it here and you have to cut one actor. <laughs> so, because there was a, a, a character who was sort of like the comic relief who kind of bookended the play. And I was like, you got to get rid of that guy. So you figure out a way you can just get rid of him. So we could afford to do it in terms of the space and paying for the space um, and the actors. Cause I think there were eight or nine actors in that show. And for PAC, that's about what we do. Like we're for a small company, we do big cast. So like I'd say our average is eight. Um, we did a season a couple of years ago talking about like seasons where there's like themes to it. Uh, we did a Jacobean season. Uh, the Jacobeans were like, it, were the plays right after Shakespeare's time. So, which included Shakespeare as well, because it it's James, James the first. Um, so we did as plays, as full productions, All is Well That Ends Well by Shakespeare, uh, the, White, the White Devil by John Webster. And then for our readings, we did The Roaring Girl by Decker and Middleton. And we did Tis Pity She's a Whore by John Ford. So it all of a sudden became a thematic season without us realizing it with three of the plays. And then we asked Jess Bedford, it's like, can you pick a Jacobean play? And she did. And then we loved doing Tis Pity so much that that became a full production two years later. With getting back into economics, I said, if you can get it to 10 actors, I can get you two equity contracts because then we could afford that. She came back to me with a script for 13 actors. And I was like, you get one equity actor. <laughs> and then everyone else is non equity because even at 13, that's, that's like all, and like, well, like I said before, all our money goes to the actors. Like that's, that's where the, the budget is budgeted for. Um, did that like touch on the question? Or yeah, I and I would, I would say that's probably true for both your companies in terms of where sort of some of the line items are. You're not doing plays with big royalties, if any. Um, and for those who don't know, when we talk about Actors Equity Association is the union of professional actors and stage managers in the United States. And uh, the idea is that a union actor has a certain level of experience and credits behind them. Uh, so a lot of the um, professionals that you see around town, especially the bigger the theater, the more equity actors there are. And for a producer, that comes with having to pay into the union health plan, uh, other sort of guarantees in terms of minimums, and those sorts of things. So, so it, it becomes a, a juggling act for a lot of companies. Uh, a little bit of Jewish theater history. Actors' Equity was modeled very seriously on the Hebrew Actors Guild, which was the Yiddish theater's uh, union, actors' union. I didn't know that. That's yeah. fantastic. Thank <laughs> you. Um, and I'm going to, the pan, to the attendees, if, uh, if you have questions, throw them in the chat or the q and I'm definitely coming towards the end of, of mine, which is why they start to get a little silly here. But um, Damon, I'll start with you. Um, I'm curious about a season. You, you, this is a choose your own adventure in a little ways. Um, a season where it went better than you could have hoped for and why, or a season where you went, Ugh, or a risk you took inside of a season that panned out for you. So better than we can hope for, we did a season, uh, our fringe show was a play called The Sea Plays. And they were uh, mm -hmm. two one act plays by Eugene O'Neill that I directed on board the tall ship Gazella down at Penn's Landing. And it had 10 actors in it. <laughs> and it was a phenomenal cast, uh, such good actors, a great script, a great environment, because we did it in the hull of the ship. And it was, a, it was we do a lot of shows in the fringe uh, because people are, people, and like, I'm one of these people. I, I love seeing shows in, 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 outside of a theater. I love seeing shows in, in spaces where I don't normally get a chance to go into. And Fringe kind of gives you the opportunity to do that because people do shows all over the place. So 
that went really well and we made a profit on that show which anybody who's in nonprofit theater knows that's impossible. <laughs> so we made a profit on that show. So the way that was nonprofit fantastic. is there for a reason, right? It's right. <laughs> Just, yeah. And then that was the same year where we did Schiller's Mary Stewart. And then we which did Which I loved. And Mary that's Stewart was, was uh, a, another big artistic success for us. That, so this was, what season was that? 13, 14, I think, the 13, 14 season. So like both of those shows were just, just really great shows, really great cast, great, great artistic teams, great production teams. Um, and just like both were super critically praised and it was just like a great, great season. Um, a season where things didn't go well. Uh, a couple years later, I guess- the You don't have to name names, but you know. No, well, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't to. name names, I wouldn't. <laughs> so, so Jesse Bernstein was starring in, no, no. Uh, <laughs> only <laughs> no we did it and like it, it's like the reasons were like here's the reasons so the one show we did we did a show called the captive when we did this at the physic house and it was a really kind of like weird um it's it's about uh, it, it was a taboo like the, the the captive uh had one performance on broadway in 1926 and then was closed for indecency because it was about a lesbian relationship which was never shown on stage, it was always off stage and hinted at the entire time. So we did this at the Physic House and it was a really lovely, weird little pot boiler of a play. Yeah, um, I saw it there, it was very cool. Yeah, yeah. it was. But economically, we could only fit 38 people in the house. So at, we sold out all the time, but it was also, we could only fit 38 people in the house. Um, and it had eight actors in it. <laughs> um, and then in the spring, we did a, a really adventurous show called He Who Gets Slapped by uh, Yenyer Andreev. And this was a partnership with the Philadelphia Circus School. And we had, we wrote music. We had like uh, original music that was written for this. Um, and it was, it was great. Like, it was, uh, I, I was at, at the first, at, the, at our final tech, I directed the show. I'm watching the, the, the run through of the first act and everything is finally coming together. We had lost one week of rehearsal because we didn't budget for an extra week. So we had less rehearsal than we normally do. So, and somehow we managed to get all this music and circus art and the acting and everything involved in the show up and it was great. And then at intermission, um, Terry Brennan comes up to me and he was a partner, a partner with the circus school and was doing all the physical stuff. And he was like, hey, uh, so uh, your lead actress just broke her foot uh, and so our lead actress had broken her foot in the first, we had done this a number of times, but she just landed awkwardly and she broke her foot in this, in this, in the, the very first prologue, went through the whole first act without me knowing. And then we realized that we have to cancel the rest of the rehearsal because she needs to go to the ER to get her foot looked at. Um, so it turns out she didn't break it. She had fractured it. So we canceled our first preview. I reblocked the whole show to take her out of all the physical circus stuff, put her in the band so she ended up playing some instruments, reblocking the show so that instead of her going to people, people had to come to her. Because it's a circus, we would sometimes have her entering on people as they were coming from like off stage. And so we had to reblock the whole thing. Um, and it worked out, it worked out great. But, uh, but I know for a fact that the, the actor who's wonderful was I think affected by not being able to do the stuff that she had done before. And she was so good that I think it might've affected her a bit that she was never quite able to like invest what she was doing before because she was so disappointed that she couldn't do all the stuff that she was doing before. And I felt so badly for her, but she was brilliant and she was lovely and, and, and so heartbreaking at the same time. But it was disappointing for all of us that we couldn't do the show that that we had at one point so that's yeah i get that i spent yeah. three weeks of a rehearsal process on my one of my last shows trying to make a set piece work that i i ended up cutting two days before we started previews so um yeah art yep <laughs> um deborah i'll i'll same same sort of question to you surprisingly seasons that went surprisingly well um ones where you went what just happened or a risk you took that paid off 
So um, I, I, I made reference earlier to one of the seasons um, and that, that was our 2015-2016 um, season that I just felt it, we hit all the right emotional tones and notes. We started out with um, this one woman show that's really powerful and really moving called Blessings of the Heart, which was um, based on the memoir by Sherry Mandel, whose son was um, murdered in a terror, whose teenage son, 13 year old son was murdered in a terrorist act. But the piece is, piece is about how you heal from something like that. And Alana Gerlach just, I mean, her performance was I, you know, I still get chills when I think about it. It was just riveting. And, and, and people just responded to her, so her performance so incredibly. And then we did Cantorial, which is an Ira Levin piece. Uh, he wrote uh, Death Trap. And the conceit of that is this couple that move into a condo that was a, rich, a brand new condo on the Lower East Side, but it had originally been a synagogue and the ghost of the cantor comes. And so we, I, I had a cantor who played the cantor um, because the ghost had to sing this really, a lot of the, some of the music from actually Yom Kippur. Um, and so, and we hid him in different places. Went, like each house we went to, we found the right place for him to be hidden so you wouldn't see him. And what was fun was when, when the actors came out, you know, uh, had their curtain call and then we had the post-show discussion. People were shocked because they thought we had record, it was recorded music and they were so excited when, when um, David the Cantor came out. Um, and then we did a brand new work by um, Hank Kimmel, which I really love because it gave me the opportunity to work with an incredible cast of women um, called um, Divided Amongst Ourselves. And one of the things that's really interesting about the piece is um, it's about how do you divide an estate after your parents are gone? And so it looks at the issue of money and how that impacts on relationships. And I just found that subject matter so fascinating and, and had a great cast, a group of women, and we had incredible conversations. And Hank came up from Atlanta to be at the performances. And in fact, in that season, we had it, um, almost every play, the playwright came. Um, the, uh, Todd, who had um, adapted um, blessings from a book, from the book, came from San Francisco. And then we closed the season with this wonderful piece um, that the first act took place in Philadelphia, and then the second act took place in, 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 um, in Germany. And um, it's about uh, a family that rescued kids out of, um, of Europe during the Shoah. And um, it was, it's a really beautiful play. And again, I had a wonderful cast and, and the piece, um, I don't tend to do plays. In fact, I, I tend to, to not want to do plays about the Holocaust because I, our history is, is much bigger than that. And I'm the child of a survivor. And my mother was always concerned that the American Jewish community was a little fixated on the Holocaust and, and not thinking about the, the incredible vast history we have. But this piece was really looking at what, what it takes the courage it takes and the decision it takes for a family, an American family, affluent family to go to Europe and rescue kids. And so I felt that was really an important piece that brought a very different story. So it was a season where we just had all these incredible um, emotional journeys and stylistically the pieces were really different. Um, so that was a piece, of, that was a season I was particularly um, proud of. Um, I I would say that I haven't had a season, ever had a season where I've gone, oi, <laughs> that, was, That's that was a disaster. Um, That's probably why you're still here after 30 years. I guess so. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, thanks. Um, but I have had plays where I've gone, either I felt that I missed the mark in a way, or the play didn't quite live up to my readings of it. Um, I, I did 
I took one play that I knew was going to be a challenge because it was very dark and very complex play. And I knew I was going to be challenging my audience. And it was also a piece that needed some work. And um, I love working with playwrights. And I, I think I'm a pretty good dramaturg. But the writer and I just never kind of found a working place. And so the changes that I really felt the piece needed um, didn't happen. And in the, in the 30 years of Theater Ariel, I've never had where almost everyone in my audience has said to me, I really did like that play. But <laughs> this one time, <laughs> Except for two people who came up afterwards and said, I found that fascinating. I can't tell you how many people said, I hated that, or I didn't like it, or I don't get that. <laughs> so I think that's not too bad for a 30-year history. <laughs> oh, I would say so. Um, all right. The audience does not have a lot, any questions, which I'm going to take as a compliment to me. Yeah. insightful uh, <laughs> queries that I have put to you. Um, I am going to s wrap up here in a minute, but I, I want Deborah and Damon to get ready to get on one foot again, because the question I'm going to ask you to wrap up with is at the end of this current season with your company, what do you hope ideally your audience walks away with, or, or what do you hope it, it sends them away with, either because of the pieces or because of circumstances? Um, that's your thing to ponder while I start to wrap us up here. And I want to say um, thank you to everybody for attending. I hope you've enjoyed this. I've enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I'm going to put again in the chat Theodore Ariel and PAC's websites. Um, I think I did that right for PAC. And uh, so please check them out. Hopefully you've seen so many things go into the, the picking of a season. We could, you know, there's even more probably that we could talk about, but I hope it gives you something to think about as you, as, as those brochures come in the mail and as those emails hit your inbox and you see all the things that are happening, give you a little bit of appreciation for the, the work and the thought and the collaboration that goes into everything that's behind that. And I want to thank Deborah and Damon for, for sharing all of this and, and answering my questions. And Damon, I'll, I'll hit you. What's, what do you hope people take away from this season for PAC? Sure, I think for us, um, you know, it's an expansion of like what the classics are. Um, you know, even for, for us, you know, this, this company started years ago with me and my buddy Dan going out to breakfast and talking about all the plays that we loved that no one ever did. And we're like, you know, I love this play. It's like, I love this play too. The very first play we ever did uh, was a reading of the Duchess of Malfi by Webster. Mm -hmm. And then we did, we loved it. We did a reading of it and it went really well. And the people were like, so, uh, so when are you going to do this? Mm -hmm. And then a year and a half later, we did it. And that was our first production in the fall of 2010. And then, you know, and things kept going from there. But, you know, the company started with the plays that we knew and the things that we were exposed to. And over the past, like, especially like the past three, four years, we've come to understand as well that the classics aren't just regulated to 1592 and England, that the classics come from all over. Um, and so in the past couple of years, we've been doing these partnerships with other companies uh, to, to have other voices bring forth those classics in their voices. Um, you know, and, uh, and there's a thing called the alternative canon, which what came out about uh, sometime over the summer which is a Google Doc that I think you probably find on Facebook or, or online somewhere that gives classics of every country. So the classics that were written and, and like the main kind of, uh, you know, the Hamlets of Brazil or the, or the you know, the, the uh, Life is a Dream of Australia or, you know, whatever it is, but like from all over, all over, uh, all over the world. So that's been a great resource for us. And what we hope that like, that our people come to see and come to find is that, yeah, there are more classics out there. There are more, more stories to tell. And not only that there are more stories to tell, but the similarities in terms of like these kind of interactive human emotions and, and human interactions happen not just between, you know, people that look like us, but between all cultures, that there's that similarity there and differences 
that make us all unique and, you know, find the common ground where we can come together, you know, and enjoy the things that bring us together. So awesome. yeah, that's, that's what I hope. I, uh, I dropped a link to that alternative canon. It's a living document. Oh, yeah, good uh, job. But I believe that's at least one version of it. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Deborah, to you, sum it up. What do you hope people walk away with from this season? So um, we are often referred to as the, the people of the book. And uh, we have used stories from the beginning as a way of expressing who we are as a people and what our values are. And storytelling is, is I think, as you know, innate to um, Jewish uh, life and culture. So for me, as we, um, at the end of our 30th season, my hope is that we have celebrated the richness and the vastness of our Jewish storytelling tradition and highlighted the fact that our stories um, go across centuries, across oceans, and are told by Jews of many hues and colors and, and origins. Amazing, thank you. Um, thank you, Deborah Bear Moses, Theater Ariel. Thank you, Damon Benetti, Philadelphia Artists Collective. Thank you, attendees. You are a small but mighty group, like the casts of these companies. <laughs> and uh, I hope that you will take anything that you enjoyed or learned from this, share it with uh, your pod, share it on your Zoom calls with your friends, um, help them. I think sometimes we think about theaters as an individual performance that we happen to catch. And especially in the, the nonprofit world, um, there's companies behind them and there's thought behind so much of, of what's happening around that performance as well and the brand of the company. And so I hope that you've seen a little bit of what goes into that and you'll take that with you as you explore not only these companies, but everything that Philadelphia has to offer, but especially these companies. You should go to their websites, become members. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, David. Enjoy your Thank week. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.